Roll call, please. Sue Ashton. Here. <clears throat> Heidi Bassford Kirkhoff. Here. Julie Kiefer. Here. Lurton Blassingame. Here. Ron Dirkhoff. Here. The Indy Kleckel is excused. Julie Maslowski. Here. Judy Ritchie. Here. Deb Allison Osby. Jean Wallerman. Here. And Dave Chapman. And Dave Chapman, uh, alternate should be on there. He's not here today. Okay. We need, do we have room for more alternates than we have now? Okay, we've got the one alternate and we have room for one more. Okay, I have a, there's a, a website for volunteers that's going to be announced tomorrow in Northwestern. And it's a wonderful, wonderful website and I'll give you the information afterwards. Okay, uh, but yes, we have room for one more. Anyone that's interested, uh, the basic requirements are uh, living within the city limits of Oshkosh, um, preferably working with aging or being uh, a senior. Uh, the, if you go on to the City of Oshkosh website under Committee on Aging, you'll find the, the details. Okay, approval of the minutes. And Bobby struggled because she wasn't here and trying to get everything off the video wasn't quite as, as easy as it would seem. So um, with the third version that went out, uh, can I have a motion for approval? I have a couple of suggestions uh, first, okay. if you would. Um, if you go to section F, old, mis old business, and then uh, sub D, and then be the second bullet point, um, I, I would recommend that instead of the word ends vetoed would be uh, assembly bill 76 governor evers vetoed the republican uh, is is a little more direct in terms of what happened he did end it but that's how he ended it with a, a governor's veto and then the last sentence of that same section uh, i think is sort of repeats what's what's uh, in the last bullet point in that section uh, where it says mrs Maslowski, Governor Evers, created a caregiver's task force to report in February with results. So I'd just delete that because it's already stated in the last bullet point on the, on the page, if that makes sense. So I would move that those changes be made. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, citizen statements. Bryn. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Bryn Seaman, one of the program supervisors with your Winnebago County Aging and Disability Resource Center. Um, from last month, I thought I'd just give a few updates about outreach as well as um, our Wellness Plus group. And then lastly, our Welcome to Medicare presentations for 2020. Um, as far as our outreach, our diversity and inclusion efforts continue. So our ADRC director has um, gathered a group of champions from a variety of different cultures um, to help us identify ways to make sure we're doing proper outreach to everybody who might need ADRC services. Um, so that includes the expansion of translation services for um, our brochures. Uh, last month, we also attended the Hmong New Year event, and we plan to attend in April, I believe it is, the uh, uni Unity in the Community event. Um, again, just to spread uh, awareness of the ADRC. Um, on January 30th, we'll be attending the Business Expo, and the goal for that is to hit employee bases and hopefully make those connections with local employers so that those individuals who might be caring for older parents or maybe just older neighbors, older friends, as well as possibly caring for their children are available or knowledgeable of um, those services of, um, through the ADRC. Um, in addition to um, aging and senior types of supports and services, the ADRC also assists even young adults with disabilities. So we are participating in the family night transition at the Fox Valley Technical College. That is um, next Monday, I believe, January 13th. And that's an opportunity for not only the ADRC, but transportation providers, special education teachers, a division of vocational rehabilitation to help support those families through that transition. 
I did also have on my list to just make mention of uh, the volunteeroshkosh.org, um, which is a very um, good site that I was able to attend the training for. And the ADRC does have volunteer opportunities listed there, primarily for the um, guardian pool guardianship um, opportunities. And I'd recommend it um, not only for agencies looking to post opportunities, but if you're um, seeking uh, maybe just a one instance or a reoccurring instance, that opportunity to um, go to that site and um, get some options available. Um, the EDRC also will be hosting the community education event. This isn't until April, but I thought just to spread the word, I do have some flyers available. This is also on our Facebook page. It's also on our website, so I can certainly hand those out to anybody who might be interested. The focus for this go round is on estate planning, long-term care insurance, advanced directives such as um, power of attorney for health care and finance. Um, jumping down to Wellness Plus, uh, Winnebago County has named a health um, evidence-based health promotions class Wellness Plus. Uh, it's a good description of the variety of different agencies that come together and the coordinator for that position is actually out of our um, county's health department and given the wonderful benefits of those classes and the coordination and our desire to try and fill each of those classes that are offered, um, we not only have that on our site but I did also bring the 2020 evidence-based classes calendar so if anybody would like that this is also available and then lastly jumping down to our welcome to Medicare presentations Joan and Julie who are elderly benefit specialists with the ADRC who've been here in the past are very well versed and they take a great amount of effort in putting together presentations that are pertinent to the year so each year some Medicare rules change and they do their best to try and update um, update all the nuances of Medicare from year to year. So again, I have both our Nina and Ashkash events here for handout. They're also on Facebook and they will be going out on Facebook as events as each um, comes to pass. So there's January, April, May, July and September and you don't need to be fearful about capturing all the dates again I have the handouts um, for anybody who might want them um, and we are asking that if people are able to RSVP or indicate some interest just so we can gauge the amount of audience that we might be able to be hosting at each of the events those two are available on our website or, or will be if they're being posted today and I think those are my highlights from last month. Are there any questions or comments? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Lily Davids, do you have anything? No. Bobby, do you have anything? Hi there, I haven't been at this. Okay, you need to come up to the podium. <laughs> Hi there, it's a pleasure to get reacquainted with Oshkosh. Haven't lived here for a while. Um, I'm mostly here to see the, uh, the meeting and also hear the information, but I would like to mention that I am currently working with Brookdale Appleton, which is a retirement community on the west side of Appleton. Pleasure to be here, thank you. Thank you. Okay, does anyone else have anything? All right, then we're going to move on to new business. <clears throat> First of all, we had um, had Ken Arneson listed as our speaker for the month. He has a conflict with his schedule. He will be with us next month. And then I posed um, a discussion on identifying and addressing isolation and loneliness. Erin, would you like to come up to the table, please? <coughs> As we update our uh, goals and ideas with our strategic plan, one of the things that was identified through the Older Adult Collaborative Group and a number of other um, meetings and groups earlier on, isolation and loneliness were really identified as an issue and trying to get them identified, actually explaining what they are, are they interchangeable or are they not? And Erin has been sort of a partner in crime on some of this stuff. So 
Uh, I've asked her to actually sit at the table with us. We will have a speaker in April that will deal a lot more deeply on the subject. So some of the facts that we had were 17% of adults 65 and older are isolated. 26% are at increased risk of early death due to subjective feeling of loneliness. And 46% of women age 75 and older live alone. Those are some <clears throat> pretty rough statistics. And how many of you think that isolation and loneliness are interchangeable? Or how would you identify, how would you explain isolation versus loneliness? Aaron, okay, Julie. I would just say to an extent they're interchangeable, but um, I think each of those words can be elaborated on with different meanings, um, but <clears throat> to an extent they can be interchangeable. Not always, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in other words, I think what you're saying is some people could be isolated but not necessarily lonely. Right. Yeah. And and probably vice versa. Yeah. yeah. Took the words out of my mouth. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you have said it well. Erin? Uh -huh. Yep, so Judy's correct, whereas, you know, there are people who prefer to be on their own. And so they're not necessarily isolated, but um, but we're looking at like loneliness. I mean, that can happen amongst the entire lifespan. And what we're finding is that, um, you know, we have Winnebago County has a drug and alcohol kind of coalition that has worked with, you know, trying to determine, you know, how do we prevent kids from getting drugs? And so what's actually come out of that has been the connectedness, the social connectedness, making sure, um, that people throughout their lifespan are connected. So I think they've started looking from 18 and up. And so what we're finding is that um, it, we know it's a problem. You know, we know that there's people out there. I think there was just a, the New York Times did an article that I read in um, December about a 50-year-old who put a, she was from Tulsa, I believe, or... She was not from Wisconsin, but regardless, she was only 50 years old. She had put a post in Craigslist, Craigslist asking um, if anybody wanted a grandma for the holidays because she was estranged from her family. She didn't have anybody else to spend the holidays with, and so she had put that out there in Craigslist. And so it just made people more aware of what's, you know, how lonely people can get, and especially around those holidays you know, where people are all kind of coming together with their family and friends, and if you don't have that, how lonely you feel. So um, in April, Stephanie Gildeband is going to kind of come and talk because what they've been working on is they've been doing more regional um, work trying to deal with this issue as well and kind of show how it's all connected. So I have, like, what she hands out um, just about how connected is, is the key and how different things kind of play into to loneliness and isolation, but you will always have those people who like to be on their own, and that's fine. Um, but then there is, there is a significant amount of people out there that need to be connected in some way, shape, or form, and so how do we reach those? And that's kind of what we're working on. The next sheet that I'm passing around is how lonely are you? And it was an ARP um, measure of loneliness. Questions that are on there, and I'm not going to go through all of them uh, for everybody, but how often do you feel unhappy doing so many things alone? Well, there are some people that are introverts that really want to do it alone. They don't like going clothes shopping with somebody else because they think they're going to be talked into something or judgments made about what your grocery shopping or all sorts of things. Um, some are very happy just being able to uh, sit in a corner and read a book or do their knitting or uh, men escaping to their workshop. And that doesn't mean they're lonely. It doesn't mean they're isolated. 
Um, so a lot of things that, that play into that. Um, how often do you feel shut out and excluded by others? Um, again, introverts tend to kind of take that step back and, you know, are they feeling shut out or are they just feeling too surrounded, too confined, almost claustrophobic? So there's a lot of things that come into play with that. Um, one piece that I, when I went through that and what my scoring was, left a little bit to be desired. Um, and that it dealt more with sometimes um, you can be alone in a big group and you can be very content on your, on your own. Um, I, no, that wasn't the one that I had the issue with. Um, this one, how connected are you? And, you know, I live alone. Okay, am I living alone in my house out in the country? Or am I living in an apartment with lots of neighbors of similar age and interests? So I'm not alone. And I'm certainly not lonely. And there's plenty of opportunities. Um, and those are things that you need to consider. Seeing and talking to family members regularly. That may not be the case because of all the schedules or some of the dysfunction. But what about your chosen family, your neighbors? So some of these connectedness, uh, again, can be very subjective. And you can nod your head. You've got some other comments on that. Well, no, I just agree with you. <laughs> I'm like, it can be subjective. I think, though, you have to, even for introverts, you have to give them an opportunity to be social. Um, because I think on some level, everybody has the need to feel connected to oh, some. Correct. Mm -hmm. So I think even introverts need that opportunity to become, um, feel connected with the community some way or another. And there may be other ways. They may like to volunteer. They, they do. Or, and, or volunteering from, from home. <laughs> yeah. uh, how many people <laughs> like to go to early service on Sunday because it's a smaller group and they feel it's cozier? than going to the later service with the packed pews and not knowing the people that are there. So it's comfort levels. Oh my goodness, different colors. Of course, <laughs> how else would we know what sheets we're looking at? Can I add something, Judy? Yes. Um, since becoming a corporate guardian, I have noticed that the individuals that are alone or lonely um, tend to be very vulnerable and being taken advantage of. Absolutely. I'm seeing a lot of financial exploitation happening, mm -hmm. which is alarming to me at the rate that, that I see it. Yeah. Um, so that's something that we need to be mindful of as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we're looking at scams. And, and we, we've been covering that somewhat with the scams, and Stephanie's going to have a lot more dealing with that, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, and as we see some of the decline with our seniors, they become more vulnerable. And it's not always that their family are neglecting them or other people are neglecting them. It's just their needs have changed so drastically over time that they perceive this person as being a better friend because they don't have the baggage that goes with those past relationships. And so, again, that's one of the observations that I've had. Yes, Lurton. Mm -hmm. Some, this is not a politically divisive issue. Some people may think that loneliness, that's what bleeding heart liberals are concerned about. We don't have to worry about it. Ben Stasi, who describes himself as either the first or second most conservative member of Congress in a book this year wrote, quote, scientists are now showing that loneliness affects the brain and bodies of billions of people in measurable and alarming ways. And a little further on, he writes, there's a growing consensus that the number one health issue in America right now is not cancer, not obesity, and not heart disease, it's loneliness. And with our nation's aging population, it's only going to get worse. So it's not a 
political issue one way or another. Correct. Uh, I think one of the things, too, and I have a neighbor that's a great <clears throat> illustration of this, um, even though she doesn't get to see her great-grandkids as frequently as she would like, uh, she's able to FaceTime with them regularly. And she is so excited, and she is so connected with those, those little kids. And so when they come, it's, you know, it's heaven on earth for her to have them in her home. But they're in her home every day with t today's technology. And when Pam was here with the Neighborhood Associations, the grant that they have, in Julie, I think you can address that a little bit too, the grant that um, they're getting for the technology to address some isolation in neighborhoods, I think is going to be another plus for the community. Um, I don't know, maybe I would defer to Jean because that's really a, a coming from okay. the Senior Center originally, correct? Yeah, yes, the yeah. Senior Center, Ann Schaefer wrote the grant and uh, the neighborhoods are just a partner in with the grant. So we will know by mid-January if we receive that grant and then um, we'll definitely, I think there may be a time when Ann can also come in and maybe explain to everybody if we do receive that grant going forward. Right. Um, and how we're going to be utilizing that and the partners are that who are all involved I think the neighborhood associations would get involved then um, or I should say healthy neighborhoods would get involved because there will be a staff position then that will work on identifying those people within the neighborhoods Correct. <laughs> I would say even in my four years at Bella Vista seeing seniors embrace technology more mm -hmm. and how they use it whether they're blind and they're using Alexa to call <clears throat> or we just had a gentleman where his granddaughter got married and we were able to Skype so he could watch the, the wedding um, live. Yeah. Those things are connecting those, making those connections again, which um, I think is very sure. valuable. Yeah. And Aaron, how did, how did the grandma make out with the Craigslist uh, post well, there? Did that work out for According to her? the article, okay. she got a lot of flack for yeah. you know yeah. putting the article out, so she took it off. But then somebody had put another one in saying looking for grandma because they had <laughs> they, so they found her good and she ended up having a good friendship and now they kind of work on advocating for social isolation and loneliness and so right yeah so they kind of look for families around or people okay. around the holidays so the technology a, worked it did and, yeah mm -hmm. great yeah. piggybacking on the wedding um, one of the services that is being offered with a number of the funeral homes is also the actual funeral services themselves so that people across the country that can't make it there can be a part of that final service and everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, technology can help to reduce a certain amount of that isolation and loneliness. And so we need to be exploring all these different ideas and that's where Again, Stephanie is coming in. But I, I wanted to bring it to this group because one of the challenges I did last month was to look at our parts our, with our work groups, looking at the parts of the strategic plan, where we are, where we're going, where we want to see in the future. And with the isolation and loneliness factor, uh, that needs to be incorporated more in what we're doing also because it's not just this little pocket and that little pocket and that little pocket. They all interface with one another. So that was my reasoning for bringing it. I am so happy that uh, we have our speaker all set. And I think she can kind of give us some direction as to which way we can, be, you know, how you can be more most beneficial with the issue and where you can give your you know give your wisdom and help out so okay do you have anything else to report from the health department not from the no i was going to do the wellness plus classes <laughs> <laughs> she did it so i'm good <laughs> can I have one? okay yes i can pass these around this is what stephanie will probably share and this is just from the winnebago um county drug and alcohol kind of when they were looking at youth but it just kind of shows like how everything's connected with uh, connectedness. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah. And I have one more thing to add about that. Um, I'm on this next door neighbor 
thing where, you know, neighbors want to sell something or they want to find somebody to paint their house or do that. And the last one in this last week was, was kind of about um, getting to know your neighbor. And it said that like over 46% of people don't even know who their next door neighbor is. Yeah. Um, which to me is like, whoa, that, that is like, and so somebody <clears throat> was just saying, can't you just be kind and say hello or bring some cookies over to your neighbor or do something to put yourself out there a little bit to make a friend, to be a good neighbor, because that is a huge percentage of people who don't even know who's living next to them and don't really even care. Mm -hmm. I mean, just think about it. You know, you go to the grocery store, you, you hit the button to go into your garage and you hit it again to close the door. I mean, you don't see people sitting on the porch anymore talking or doing things like that that would invite somebody to you know, get to know your neighbor. So it's just, um, I thought that was really incredible that that was just on the site. And to be a good neighbor, just say hello, you know, get to know who your neighbor is. Okay, so the site that you're talking about, mm -hmm. when I tell us a little bit more, because not all of us are well informed on what it is. Well, I, I'm not even sure if I'm using the right terminology, but it's a little greenhouse and um, you get invited by another person in the neighborhood to join. Like I got an invitation from a girl that lives maybe three blocks from me. Do I want to join this? And I'm thinking, well, do I or don't I? So, you know, I joined it and it's pretty good because there's a police officer, um, Kate Mann, and she tells things that are going on in the neighborhood. Like if there's been a robbery or people put on there if there's a lost dog you know things like that that you kind of want to be aware of and and helpful in your neighborhood but in order to join like I had new neighbors and they were looking for some things because they needed lots of things done I said well why don't you join this group you know and you have to be invited by somebody in the neighborhood um, to join it and so it, it's pretty cool so if you know somebody in your neighborhood who's on it they can invite you and then you know you're part of the neighborhood group and it's I live on 20th Ave so it it, it extends I mean to the airport and all around the area so it isn't just a small group it's it's pretty widespread so I don't know whoever words, started it extends it. beyond your neighborhood yes yes mm -hmm. it does yeah so and, and people called, buy and yeah. sell things on it and you know there's all kinds of things you can do on that um, so I'm kind of glad I, I mean at least I know even if I don't want to participate well, you know what's going on mm -hmm. so it's a website and do you get alerts it's uh, an that email something's been posted site. or yeah mm -hmm. it's an email site yeah yeah oh, mm -hmm. okay yeah when it comes through on your email there's a little greenhouse it's like Oh, next okay. door something or other I, I'll have to get the okay. right terminology but I think it's called I next always door look for, yeah. I think so it's yeah. just uh, has anybody heard of it yeah nobody here yeah. okay heard heard of it, but we didn't know about it yeah it's email email it's email okay. yeah because mm -hmm. not everybody's on Facebook so I think That's they true. just kind of keep it <coughs> and it is pretty much in your area like if you have in a garage sale or something you know mm -hmm. post it on there whatever then you might want to invite Ron and Mia to be. I could if I want to. If you want us, that Judy. <laughs> and if you don't want us, then you block us. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway. Yeah, there is a website called Next Door. Okay. Uh, I'll have to uh, see what it com is. or whatever. Yeah, and it gives some information like that. Yeah. And I guess you can do a search on there to see if there is one in your neighborhood. Okay. Your location. Um, so, um, but I understood that it was a—it was actually a website that people would then be posting stuff to. But no, it's more of an, a, email. an email. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, are you inundated with a lot of email? Is there a lot of? Um, you, you don't have to read it if you don't want it. But I mean, you it, see the uh, little uh, green thing, and you can either still comes into your box. <laughs> look it, look it up, or you, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. just bypass it. Whatever you want to do, but okay. uh, well, like you, know. you do with my emails. <laughs> yeah, right, Judy. Whatever. Sure. Anyway. Okay, um, anything else along that line? Okay, then we're going to go into old business. 
and starting with strengthen our partnership with neighborhood associations and other partners Lurton uh, <coughs> there was no meeting of the neighborhood associations the last two months the change now is it'll be on the second Monday of the month at the senior center and you had asked at the last meeting whether we were going to uh, where we're at and where do we want to go and going forward did you want to do that now or did you uh, we're going to do a little more detail next month so we don't need to do that now no all right i'll pass on to the next person then improving access to affordable transportation and delivery services for seniors and i I had something that was sent to me and I don't remember what it was, so I'm gonna pass on that one today. Uh, creating community design and policy that supports an age-friendly community, Jean. Um, I don't have anything for this month, but I'm going to be, uh, Heidi and myself and uh, Bryn is gonna join us with uh, ADRC and uh, there has been work with this age-friendly community with the ADRC, so we're just gonna kind of join forces to try to blend our our findings together and then we'll come back in February and report so okay thank you improving communication and visibility of available services to seniors I'm going to start with Julie down there this time um, well next Wednesday we'll have uh, Ron and Judy joining us at Bella Vista to um, present to the Oshkosh Senior Resource Group at 9 a.m. Um, they're just going to be sharing with that group um, all the valuable things that we discuss here and how they can maybe be a part of it. Um, so we look forward to having you next Wednesday. Thank you. And everybody from our committee or those of you sitting out there today are welcome to attend. Um, also, uh, as you're as others are hearing about these uh, work groups that we have, we're not required, we're not stuck to having simply our committee members on there. As other groups are working on similar um, initiatives, ideas, uh, they're welcome to join us, share that information. It's always better to share than to reinvent something. So, uh, Anyone that has interest in any of these areas, please see me or Ron, and we'll um, bring you in the group for that type of discussion. So, Ron, okay. you always have lots of good Well, we've got a few things here. Uh, the, uh, in the, during the first week of December uh, last year, 2019, the Governor's Task Force on Reducing Prescription Drug Prices met for the first time. So there's some action going on at the state level. Uh, there's a t uh, the stakeholders for that group are people from the healthcare industry, uh, uh, state agency officials, legislators, consumers, uh, and they're responsible for gathering and analyzing data on the development, pricing, distribution, and purchasing of uh, prescription drugs in Wisconsin. And just a little stat on that: for example, uh, we know that drug prices have gone kind of through the roof in many with many drugs. Uh, um, they said that in 1999, a vial of insulin was $16, and now it costs 340 just to give an example. And that's a pretty common uh, medication used by many. Um, so, uh, and prescription drugs account for 10% of overall health spending in the U.S. and are estimated to cost Wisconsin residents $1.3 billion uh, last year in 2019. Um, and they're, they're inviting uh, public comment. So if uh, people want to uh, submit comments to this task force or subscribe to their email distribution list, um, it's all caps now, O-C-I-R, small x, capital D-R-U-G, capital T-A-S-K, capital F-O-R-C-E, at wisconsin.gov. And that's uh, O-C-I-R, little x, Drug, capital D, task, capital T, force, capital F, and then at wisconsin.gov. And then um, there's uh, legislation that is uh, just being uh, introduced um, uh, late in 2019 called uh, Assembly Bill 479. 
this bill creates a requirement that uh, a court expedite proceedings in criminal and delinquency cases and juvenile dispositional hearings involving a victim or witness who is an elder person. Um, and they're describing elder person as somebody 60 and older. Um, <clears throat> uh, under the bill, uh, the court must uh, appropriate, uh, take appropriate action to ensure a speedy trial in order to minimize the length of time the elder person must endure the stress of involvement in the proceedings. Uh, in ruling uh, on any motion or other request for delay uh, or continuance of proceedings, the court shall, dis shall consider and give weight to any adverse impact the delay on continuance may have on the well-being of a victim or witness who is an elder person. Uh, and then finally, there's uh, in all criminal, uh, or excuse me, the, the court shall upon uh, motion of a district attorney conduct a hearing within 60 days of the date the motion was filed to preserve the testimony of the crime victim or witness. The hearing shall be before the court. The defendant shall be present at the hearing. The crime victim or witness shall be sworn in as a witness and shall be subject to cross-examination. Uh, and rebuttal if not un unduly repetitious. And it says the witness may testify in person or upon showing by a, pro a proponent of good cause uh, testimony received into the record uh, of the hearing by telephone or live audiovisual means. So that's kind of a change that they'd be able to provide testimony by phone or audiovisual. Uh, the hearing shall be recorded and the recording, uh, recorded testimony of the witness shall be admissible in evidence against the defendant in any court proceedings in the case, any subsequent court proceedings. So uh, we'll kind of be following that. It's, it was uh, introduced uh, December uh, 26th. Um, I should say it was passed by the Judiciary Committee. This is at the state level now uh, on the 26th and referred to the Committee on Rules. Uh, that same day. So maybe we'll be hearing some more about that. And I think that's important uh, legislation because uh, the, the testimony of some victims, particularly of uh, elder abuse, uh, this would be one way to get their testimony without it being so intimidating because many times the case goes nowhere because the person says, I, I don't want to, I don't want to get involved in this, you know for a variety of reasons. Uh, another update, uh, this has to do with uh, the Senate uh, voting to, uh, or making movement anyway, to reauthorize the Older Americans Act. Um, in uh, the week of December 20th, the Senate Aging Committee uh, introduced the modernization of the Older Americans Act amendments, that's S3057. Uh, which would reauthorize the Older Americans Act for seven years uh, with increased funding levels for the various programs. So the status right now, now we had talked at a previous meeting here about the House passing similar legislation called the Dignity and Aging Act, H.R. 4334, that was in October. So now the Senate is uh, moving on this. The status right now is it's been read twice and referred to Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. That was December 16th that that occurred. Um, another update has to do with Medicaid uh, spousal impoverishment protections and the money follows the person uh, provisions. We've talked about those in past meetings. Um, and Congress passed a year-end funding package that includes temporary extension of the protections for spousal impoverishment uh, and for the Money Follows the Person program um, through May 22nd of this year, 2020. So they've kicked it ahead. There's effort to make that a longer term or a permanent uh, provision uh, in the funding bills for the Older Americans Act, et cetera. Uh, but <laughs> so far, not getting that kind of uh, attention. Um, let's see. This has to do with uh, something that's been in the, in the news regarding the Affordable Care Act. 
some refer to it as Obamacare. Uh, the technical name is the Affor Affordable Care Act uh, and provisions that the court have been striking down. In 2017, the Congress repealed the Affordable Care Act's uh, uh, the, the Affordable Care Act's tax penalty for not having health insurance. You recall that. Uh, since then, uh, Texas and 19 other states filed a lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the individual mandate and the entire Affordable Care Act in federal district court. Now, a year ago, uh, the judge in that case declared the entire ACA unconstitutional. Uh, now, just this past week, uh, let's see, the, the week that this came out was uh, just before um, the end of the year. So it had been the last week in December. The uh, Fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the district court's finding uh, that the individual mandate is unconstitutional, but remanded the case back to the district court to clarify whether the rest of the Affordable Care Act can remain in place. So it's important to note that... Uh, Although the appeals court decision represents a threat to the Affordable Care Act for 100 million Americans with pre-existing conditions, many of whom are older adults, age 50 to 64, the Affordable Care Act remains the law as this case continues to make its way through the courts. So there'll be certainly more coming on that as well. Um, and then a, a, a piece that just came through uh, uh, December 23rd has to do with the Security Act. You perhaps have heard about that. It uh, stands for Setting Every Community Up for Retirement Enhancement. Say it again. <laughs> setting Every Community Up for Retirement Enhancement. Secure <laughs> Act. Um, this has to do with uh, encouraging people to save for retirement. Um, the bill was drafted uh, to uh, address the Americans' difficulty in saving and investing for retirement. A 28 study by Northwestern Mutual found that one in five Americans have no retirement savings at all, while one in three of those closest to retirement age have less than $25,000 saved. Um, and they're saying given the longer life expectancies than previous generations coupled with the rate of inflation, a minimum balance of a million plus is recommended for retirement accounts by the date a person retires. So what this uh, legislation does, and it actually has been passed, uh, the SECURE Act was, uh, was passed, uh, let's see, um, passed the Senate in December, uh, and it had passed the, the um, House in July, and the president signed it on de December 20th. One of the things it does that's probably most most people will think about is that required minimum distributions won't have to be taken until you're 72. It's not retroactive for those of us who've crossed over, by the way, <laughs> or 70, 70 and a half. Uh, so 72 is the new age uh, for those uh, who are not yet. Uh, 71 and a half, or 70 and a half. Uh, and Just by a year, then. Yes. Well, actually, it increases it from 70 and a half to 72. Yeah. Okay. A year and a half. Year yeah, half. right. And one of the things that uh, there is in the bill that passed to, to pay for this, because there's obviously a cost and that people will delay taking their required minimum distributions if they can, uh, therefore, less revenue into the, the federal coffers is that uh, uh, to raise the estimated $15.7 billion to pay for these changes, uh, removing the stretch IRA, S uh, that's the estate planning strategy that permits non-spouse beneficiaries of IRAs to spread the disbursements uh, from the inherited money over their lifetime, the new limit will be 10 years. So uh, let's say... A, adult child who receives the uh, IRA will have to pay the taxes on that over the 10 years rather than over their lifetime, which is, can be quite a difference. Um, so a couple of the fact, other factors, they're raising the RMD age to 72. Uh, another one is allowing retirement benefits for long-term part-time employees. 
which wasn't the case before, uh, removing maximum age limits on retirement contributions, formerly capped at 70 and a half. So um, even if a person worked beyond 70 and a half, you couldn't contribute anymore. Well, now you can. So it, it opens it up. It's in somewhat encouraging for people to save more, invest more for their own retirement. So we'll, we'll see if that actually works out that way. Um, the final thing is, is uh, we talked about the uh, Medicare now, as of January 1, uh, covering opioid treatment programs. Um, and we, that was just kind of announced uh, at our last meeting, just a little bit more about that. The Medicare Part B now covers opioid use disorder treatment received at opioid treatment programs, or OTPs, effective the first of the year, and Medicare did not previously do this. OTPs, uh, which are also known as methadone clinics, are certified by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, sometimes referred to as SAMHSA, to provide methadone as part of the medication-assisted treatment. Opioid treatment programs are the only places where you can receive methadone to treat opioid use disorder. And then, uh, if you have a Medicare Advantage plan, your plan must cover the same services that are covered by original Medicare, but they, uh, there can be some different costs or restrictions uh, that are uh, implemented with the Medicare Advantage versus original Medicare and a supplement. So that's the word on that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is you may want to see sort of a long communication. Like it's uh, something with okay. the sheriff's department. Um, it was reported that in 2019, the staff, um, dispatch staff at the uh, communication center, responded to 2,038 accidental 911 yeah. calls, and people usually hang up and, and then. They have to call back and check on everything. And they're really concerned about that. If you uh, accidentally, if you butt dial uh, 911, stay on the line, talk with the dispatcher. Otherwise, they actually have to call you back or come to your site and check. And it may be costing someone else that really truly has an emergency. So it was that got quite a bit of press in the last um, week. So that was. Communication. Yes. That's a biggie. Okay. Um, other business is discussion and information pertaining, pertaining to scams and targeting senior citizens. And again, I know you've got some, Ron. I got one. It has to do with uh, uh, hanging up on robocalls. Uh, this was out of uh, Representative Grossman's newsletter. Uh, and you probably have seen some news uh, about this, too, because it it just recently passed. Uh, it's estimated that Americans received 47.8 billion robocalls in 2018. Most of them to me, I think. <laughs> Learn God, most of them. Okay, and 57% uh, increase over 2017, and in 2019 they're on track to even be even higher. This was actually something published in 2019. Um, and he says that uh, in order to reduce the overall frequency of robocalls, uh, Senator John Thune of, of uh, South Dakota introduced S-151 called the TRACED Act. And I don't know what that breaks down to mean, but I'm sure it's uh, an exciting acronym. Um, that was introduced January 16th of 2019, uh, which would improve enforcement policies by criminalizing illegal robocalling and increasing the civil penalty to $10,000 per call. Uh, additionally, uh, major phone carriers such as Verizon and AT&T would be required to implement technology improvements to identify and authenticate the source of calls so consumers will know who is calling them before they fall into a trap. Uh, that The Trace Act uh, passed the Senate uh, May 20, 23rd of 19, and uh, it passed the House by a large margin, margin 4,417 to 3. So um, it's the law of the land now, so hopefully you won't get as many robocalls anymore. 
It was signed into law on yeah. December 30th. December 30th. And TRACE stands for telephone, there we go. robocall, abuse, criminal enfor enforcement, and deterrence. So I have an article here for the bottom. Good, good, great. Okay, anything yeah. else? Oh, that's it. There's also, and I'm sure several of you have already heard this, the consumer advocates are recommending that when you're signing documents, checks, whatever, don't just put 20 for the year to put the full 2020 huh. because you can be, um, somebody can post date a check and that's hanging out there forever. They can um, put 2019 and have you responsible for a lot more payments, all sorts of things that are not really very pleasant. And that mm. came out of the um, Better Business Bureau, Susan Bach. So I have a sheet that Bobby can also include. And I think that's all that I had. Um, anyone else have anything? Lurton, did you have anything to share? Julie? Heidi? No, thank you. Susan? Well, mainly it's, um, you know, the flu is really on the rise, and they yeah. say that it's <clears throat> going to be one of the worst that it's been in the last 40 years. So if you haven't gotten your flu shot yet, be sure to get it. And then I have run into friends and neighbors who um, think they're coming down with the flu, but they're not sure. But everybody else they were around had the flu, and they're going to go anyway because they, they don't feel sick yet. Well, the incubation period for the flu is one to four days. So if you've been exposed to somebody that actually has the flu, um, you know, I guess looking at it, you could be sick within one day, but the average is two days, and it can go as far as four days. So just kind of keep that in mind if you've been exposed to somebody who actually has the flu as to what you should be doing if you're going somewhere and exposing other people before you're actually sick because you can you've spread the flu 24 hours before you actually are ill with the flu mm -hmm. so people aren't aware of that and they need to be what about the other end when are you no longer spreading flu even though you may feel sick well I would say you shouldn't be exposing anybody if you still feel sick that's just kind of typical. With or, some colds, I understand. You, you well, spread it early and while you have it, but not necessarily at the end because you're no longer contagious. Is that not true? I, I'm not sure exactly. You okay. know, we're talking about colds or we're talking about the flu, but mainly I'm just talking about the flu here because um, you, know, you, you just kind of have to be aware. I had some friends who were gonna go somewhere and everybody in the household was sick but them. Well, you know, I don't think that's real smart then to go somewhere where you're exposing older people to when all these other people have been sick just because you're not sick yet, you know. Just so, just use caution, you know. Just try to be careful because the flu, 11 people in Wisconsin have already, you know, died from the flu, and that's really up from years past. So um, this isn't a good variety that's going around this year. You just have to be extra careful. Winnebago yeah. County was just designated as a high. Right, above average. High volume. Above, yeah. Mm -hmm. Symptoms I'm finding with this. Well, strain. basically, it's it's the flu. People mix that up with uh, stomach flu and issues like that. Mainly, it's you start off with like a headache, your body aches, you have a fever, um, you just feel awful, and it's not so much. Um, you know, diarrhea, vomiting, stomach issues like it's that. Neuroviruses. Yeah. yeah, that's more that kind of thing. But it's it's just you know you're really really achy and you feel really sick. So right. you know you just don't want to spread it around. It's not a good thing. And the paper this morning said it comes in two waves, and this could be the first. <clears throat> it could be. I don't know. Hospitalizations, I guess, are way up in Wisconsin related to flu. And they're limiting yeah, visitors. Just the yes. Right. Keeping children out as much as possible. Right. So, yeah, it's nothing to play with. Mm -hmm. uh, Jean? Oh, no, I don't have anything. Thank you. Okay. Then just a reminder, our meeting is February 4th. Our speaker will be Ken Arneson from Evergreen. 
And on that note, I will take a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Anyone? Second. Uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>